Our nation's capital is transforming before our eyes, becoming, are you ready for this, a model of bipartisan cooperation. Here's Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren introducing Republican Governor Charlie Baker before a Senate hearing on health care premiums today. Massachusetts has a long history of bipartisan cooperation on health reform. The governor and I have continued that bipartisan cooperation uh, and tradition in recent months, and I'm glad that Congress is starting to move in this direction as well. And here are a couple of snippets of the governor's opening remarks. At the center of our bipartisan success is the belief that health care coverage is a shared commitment. Bipartisan cooperation is essential to achieving quality, affordable health care coverage and stabilizing any market. You're sensing a theme yet? But the biggest bipartisan shock in the mall may have been this moment from yesterday. Great meeting with Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, the whole Republican leadership group. And I'll tell you what, we walked out of there, Mitch and Paul and everybody, Kevin, and we walked out and everybody was happy. Whoever Kevin is. That meeting ended with the president cutting a deal with Democrats to extend disaster relief for Hurricane Harvey, while also extending the debt ceiling, a plan House Speaker Paul Ryan had slammed earlier the same day. I think that's ridiculous and disgraceful that they want to pl play politics with the debt ceiling at this moment. I'm not done. Now the Washington Post is reporting Trump and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, a Democrat, are putting their heads together on a plan to get rid of the constant 11th hour debt ceiling drama for good. So is this the start of a new chapter in Washington or just Trump being Trump? Joining me are former congressman, now interim director of Harvard's Institute of Politics, Bill Delahunt. Were you number two or number something in terms of bipartisanship? Weren't you that? There was a survey of Republicans when I was in the House my last year. And, and what did they say? You were number? They gave me high ratings. And that ended your career, obviously. Yeah, that was Boston, the end of my career. <laughs> Boston Globe columnist Scott Lee. Hi, Scott. It's good Lee to see you. Lee reported on it, and then everything was downhill. <laughs> uh, good to see you both. So uh, he makes that deal with the Democratic leadership, which is, and then he, by the way, he goes on Air Force One and praises the press for covering it so well. He tweets out an assurance to dreamers at the request of Nancy Pelosi, you have nothing to worry about. On and on, we talked about this deal. Is this just this aberrational moment, or are we actually going to see a smidgen of bipartisanship? Well, he may be shifting and triangulating, but but he, no, I don't, I think this is co a consummation devoutly to be wished, but we're not going to see it. Why no, not? I mean, if, 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 Scott, if yeah. people, if the contention, which I subscribe to, yeah. of most people, is Donald Trump is about winning. He's not about yeah. ideology at all. If the way, the path to a win or wins is working with two Democrats or ten Democrats or hundreds, why wouldn't that be the path he chose? I, I just don't see him doing that. He's too egotistical, too sharp elbowed, too intemperate and, and too impulsive to, to maintain any kind of a strategic coalition over time. This is a day or two thing, and I think he'll, he will move back and forth. He's not moored by, or anchored by anything but egotism. I cannot see him taking a strategic line and saying, I'm going to chart that. Okay, Mr. Bipartisan, are we seeing a trend here, or is this just a one-off I wouldn't done call it a thing? trend, but I, don't, I hope it's not a one-off. Uh, I think you'll see other moments in time when you'll see something similar, because I agree with you. Uh, he wants to win because that plays to his ego. Winning is all important to him. To receive those kudos, and you got to do it together. Look at Ted Kennedy. Well, who was a good buddy of yours, who was right. really the champion, even though he was the Antichrist to a lot of Republicans. Exactly. Nobody knew how to work across the aisle better than him. But, you know, another example I didn't mention to Scott a minute ago, Congressman, it, which I thought is the most significant in terms of the winning thing, Heidi Heitkamp, who's this Democrat right. from Montana, who most people think is more North at risk Dakota, than, more than North Dakota, I'm sorry, than any More Democrat in the United <laughs> States. Trump won her state by, I think, 26 points. She rides on Air Force One to right. North Dakota with the president yesterday. He calls her up to the stage in North Dakota, the only Democrat, saying she's a good woman, pretty much insulating her from attack because he's hoping to get her vote on tax reform, right? Correct. That's how you do it. That's how it? you do it. But I think the real lesson here that I've seen in the last six months is that Congress, as an institution, is asserting itself for the first time in a long time. Can you give me an example of that, please? Yeah. Uh, the defeat of Trump Care. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, the sanctions bill on Russia where they, for the first time, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly you know, handcuffed the president in terms of waiver. Statements, for example, from 
you know, not way out on the right, but moderate and conservative Republicans. But yeah, with Bob all due Corker, respect, they didn't assert themselves on the health care thing. The Republican Party was so splintered John that they couldn't get the votes. What? John McCain, John McCain is asserting Exactly, himself. but I think, I think what it is is building momentum. Jim. But, but how much do you have to reach in? If you're going to have a working coalition of Democrats who are not the far lefties, but the sort of moderate Democrats, you've got to reach a long way to the Republicans to pull people over there to make it go. And I can see four or five you can pick off in the Senate. But is there a critical mass? And in the House in particular, you got the Freedom, the Freedom Caucus crazies. Can you find enough Tuesday group people to bring over and say we're going to fuse together a working coalition of moderate uh, centrist Democrats and you guys to get something done? Especially because of something I was unaware today until Senator Markey mentioned it to us on the radio, the so-called Hastert rule, which, while not required legislatively, but as practice is, you need a majority of the Republican caucus itself not just the majority of the House to move I anything. think that they're prepared to ignore that. The you think they are? rule, I think, is dead. Or well, rename it okay. after someone else so anyway. We, right. you, know, you, know, you and no, I seem to be on the same page with the following exception. I'm not sure the Democrats themselves know how to play bipartisan. For example, I would argue that they got everything yesterday. That while Trump may have gotten points, it isn't like they gave something in return. Let's assume, for example, on this dreamer thing, which I would argue is probably at the top of the list of Democratic concerns. Right. Let's assume to get enough Republicans, to get the Freedom Caucus, they have to make a trade. The trade is, we'll give you continued protection of dreamers, people who came as kids, not on their own will, with their parents into the country illegally and grown up here just like our kids kind of thing, in return for which you Democrats have to vote for funding for the wall. Do the Democrats move in that direction, even though they don't like it, to show that they're in a bipartisan well, you're picking spirit? the wall. I don't think they would on the wall, but there will be other issues. Examples when you get into the, the nitty-gritty of tax reform. Maybe that's an area where there, be, where there can be some consensus. Well, but except every, the leading Democrats have said if there's any attempt to cut the top tax rate, whatever it is, 39.6 percent, no, we are never signing I'm talking on. about repatriation, for example. There's two to three trillion dollars sitting over, overseas. I mean, you can always pick a provision where there is a absolute no, okay? But what I'm saying is in between... You know, there's a lot of area where there is potential agreement. You know, he used to do this for a living. You and I are only observers. He seemed totally convinced that there's plenty of room for compromise amongst these parties. I, 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 know you did. It. I know you did. We did it. Why do you not buy this? Well, I, I think that in the immigration area, the compromise has got to involve another immigration piece because you've got the hardliners okay. there. So I, I, I doubt, personally, that they're going to say, okay, we'll trade you something on, on, on the dreamers for something in taxes. I think they're going to say, okay, you give us, as you say, the border wall or tougher enforcement or something else we want, and we'll do this immigration piece. But I think it, the issues are sort of of a piece. Can I, we talk about another uh, force about a retired or potentially a retired politician, how she affects this whole thing. Hillary Clinton's got a book out. Hillary I Clinton, haven't read it yet. Well, yeah, you haven't. You'll, I'm sure you'll it's get a copy. It's called Settling soon. Scores. That is, <laughs> she uh, criticizes Joe Biden. She criticizes Bernie Sanders. She even criticizes Barack Obama for putting a, quote, straight jacket on her vis-a-vis uh, -vis her just going at Bernie Sanders. Is this going to help the Democrats in their effort to, to try to regain some power in the legislative world? I don't world? think so. I, I, you know, I, I think, honestly, I think that's history. Uh, you know, I, I really do. They're respective figures nationally. They're respective figures within Democratic circles. But you've got to look forward. I think there's going to be a brand new tier of candidates. Who's going to lead that tier? There'll be people that we don't, you don't even know. Senators that are boring, or Republican, or rather, um, House We members. had one. He ran for vice president with Hillary Clinton, <laughs> yeah, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, does, how does the Hillary Clinton thing I affect this? They say that the only person in Washington who's excited about the book is Donald Trump. I think it's awful. I, you know, I, I like Hillary. I think Hillary should stay on, uh, in some degree on the yeah. stage, but not relitigate old, old grievances and sort of say, don't blame me. you got to say, hey, suck it up. Be a good loser. Move on. Be a part of the debate, but don't refocus on this stuff. I, I think it's just bad. Four names of people that are not high profile now. Do it fast. Chris Murphy from Connecticut. Mm. Chris Van Holland from Maryland, okay? On the Republican side, a, a Jeff Flake from Arizona. Who stood who, up to the president. Who stood up. So, I mean, there are people there waiting. we got to go. Congressman, it's great to see great you. To Thank see you so much. Good to see you. Scott Lehigh. Thanks, Thanks for having me, Jim. the Boston Globe.